we're going to undertake a study of the book of Daniel. And this book is one of the most fantastic books in the Bible for some very specific reasons. But I also have to share with you that for me personally, it's probably the book that impacted my life as a young, impressionable teenager more than any other thing. I had come to the Lord. I was uh, 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 in my teens. I, I accepted Jesus Christ. But like most youth, you know, was busy doing my things. But I had a friend that happened to have a copy of, uh, of Sir Robert Anderson's classic work called The Coming Prince. That book at that time was out of print. This was a treasure that he gave me as a gift. And as I got into it, I was blown away. Now that book, in the meantime, you see it was originally published in 1894 by Sir Robert Anderson. He was head of Scotland Yard. He was knighted. But he made some discoveries about the book of Daniel that are really quite startling, and we will be dealing with those when we get further into the book. But that so astonished me that it really, gal it, was that, it was the book of Daniel and the discoveries in that book that galvanized me into the reality that Jesus Christ really is who he claimed to be. You say you can't prove the Bible. Wrong, you can, if you do a little bit of homework. And the book of Daniel stands as a pillar, as an apologetic as well as a book of prophecy in both terms. So we're, I think you're going to find it one of the most rewarding studies that uh, you can undertake. The book of Daniel, of course, we're in session one, which is introduction, and we'll deal with chapter one which is basically the deportation of these teenage kids by a foreign power. Now to give you, a, put this in broad perspective as we look at the panorama of history, obviously we're far beyond Genesis, the creation of man all the way through Abraham and so forth. We're beyond the Exodus. We're in fact even beyond the monarchy. We're at the collapse of the monarchy. And uh, we are really in the, the beginning of what's called the exile, the Babylonian captivity. We're right on the threshold of that to put you in perspective here. Um, why study the book of Daniel? Well, I've mentioned because of the personal impact it had on me is one of the reasons I wanted to, I wanted to get that across. But um, the other reason most people undertake a study of this book is that it reveals all of Gentile history in advance. The Bible generally deals with history, both past and future, through the lens of Israel. You generally see things, biblically, from the frame of reference of God's chosen people, the nation Israel. But there are a couple of exceptions to that, and two of those exceptions are in this book, where the focus is on Gentile dominion. In fact, the book of Daniel shifts from Hebrew to Aramaic, which was the Gentile language in that day, for those portions. In fact, it may shock you to discover that there is a chapter in the Bible that was written by Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the world at that time. He not only wrote it, he posted it throughout the world. And for some reasons that I'll share with you when we get there, I'll share with you a, a suspicion I have. When I get to heaven, I expect to see Nebuchadnezzar there. That will surprise a lot of people, maybe even him. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> But the other thing I want you to do as we go through this book, I want you to have the benefit of the discovery of the validation of this book. And I'm going to spare you hours of boring textual research, which supports it, because we're going to, we have an end run on all of that. I'm going to spare you, with a couple of small exceptions, I'm going to spare you the archaeological discoveries. There are many. The book of Daniel is the most authenticated book in the scripture. But the, it also validates itself in, with the most astonishing passage that you, that's in the entire Bible. There's a passage in this book that by its very being there, with the precision of it being there, should put any rebuttals to silence. A proof, a bulletproof proof of the deity of Jesus Christ. And we'll deal with that, of course, when we get there. Now, most of you are probably tired of me hammering our, what really is our trademark premise, and that is the basic discoveries that underpin 
our particular ministry. We have in our laps here 66 books that we collectively call the Bible, but there's 66 separate books that were penned by over 40 guys over a period of several thousand years, about 1,500 plus. You say Moses wasn't that old. No, but Job was. You see, the book is probably the first of the books. Anyway, the point is, 66 books penned by 40 guys over thousands of years that are an integrated message. We have an integrated message here. I don't mean just thematically, that there's a theme in the Old Testament fulfilled in the New. No, much more than that. We take the position that every number, every place name, even the, the linguistic structure of the text bears evidence of integrated design, skillful, skillful anticipatory design. 66 books, 40 authors, over a thousand years. From that discovery, which you can demonstrate by just getting into it, a second discovery emerges, and that is that the, this has to have had its origin from outside the physical universe as you know it, outside the dimension of time itself. And you can prove it. Can't prove the Bible? Yes, you can. If you can establish that it's an integrated message, and you can, you can demonstrate that it had its origin from outside the dimensionality of time, and there's no other religious book on the planet Earth that can make that statement or rely on that for its validation. But I want to talk, we're not going to spend a lot of time on text, but obviously the original Hebrew, you probably, if you read in this area, you'll find it's sometimes called the Verlaga. In the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, the Old Testament as we think of it, it's pretty much pulled together. But the main point that's the anchor for your perspective here is that this entire collection that we call the Old Testament, or the, the Jews call the Tanakh, was translated into Greek. It started about 285 B.C. under uh, Ptolemy Philadelphus. Um, Seventy-two scholars were convened the best they could find in Alexandria, which was the major uh, literary headquarters in the world at that time, with the task of spending 15 years to translate the Old Testament Hebrew into Greek. The reason being that Greek was enforced as the international language in the days of, of uh, Alexander the Great. Most of the world spoke Greek. Even if you were Jewish, you spoke Greek, not Hebrew. You used Hebrew much as a Catholic uses Latin for ceremonial purposes maybe, but not to the extent that you weren't necessarily comfortable with. What the people wanted was the, their Bible, the Old Testament, in their own language, which would, was Greek. Greek is a vastly more precise language. And I won't get into a whole discussion of all of that here, uh, but we have a thing, how we got our Bible. It's also in Learn the Bible 24 Hours. We go, give you some background, the differences between Hebrew and Greek and why God uses both. But in any case, the main point is this Septuag uh, this, uh, this, the product of this translation is called the Septuagint translation. Septuagint being a fancy word for 70. It was that translation that was widely in circulation at the time of the New Testament period. Most of the quotes in the New Testament are not from the Hebrew, not from the Masoretic, that came later. It's from the Septuagint. Interestingly enough, uh, Paul quotes from the Old Testament. He's usually quoting from the Greek version of the Old Testament. The real point I want to make, the thing you can anchor on, is that the Old Testament was in black and white, so to speak, three centuries before the Gospel period. You say, well, who wrote Daniel? I can tell you, I know exactly who wrote Daniel, but that doesn't matter. Daniel was in writing, black and white, three centuries before the New Testament period. And uh, it's the one that's most quoted. The Masoretic text, which is our, usually our Hebrew standard, that was derived from works of the Council of Yamnia back in 90 AD and pulled together later. So the, actually the Septuagint is older than even our Hebrew text of the Old Testament. Are we together so far? You also need to understand that the Jews at this time, three centuries before, accepted Daniel as canonical. So it's, it's fruitless for a critic to argue about the existence of the book of Daniel. He may quibble about who really wrote it when, but he can't place it after the time it was translated into Greek, much as he might try. And they try very hard. You'll run into all kinds of characters that try to say, well, it really written later, and they try to, but that's because they're uninformed. So at the top of your notepad, in the upper right-hand corner, put Acts 17.11. That's where Luke tells you, don't believe anything Chuck Missler tells you. Okay? It, Acts 17.11 says, speaking of the, those that were in Berea, it says, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all openness 
of mind, yet they searched the scriptures daily to prove where those things were so. The Thessalonians were enthusiastic, great, but the ones in Berea were skeptical, checked it out. They, they took it with an open mind, but they checked it out, and, and they're commended for doing so. So this is a basic caveat. Don't believe anything I tell you. Check it out for yourself, okay? Daniel and the Critics Den. You know, it's interesting. No other book has been as validated as the book of Daniel throughout history. In 332 B.C., when Alexander the Great was on his conquests, when he gets to Jerusalem, the priest, the high priest then was Jadua, showed him references to himself in the book of Daniel, and the city was spared. And that's recorded by Josephus. So Daniel was a book, venerated, in fact, spared the city three centuries before uh, 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 the, the events here. Now, by the way, uh, I won't get into a lot of archaeology. We could spend all time doing that, but I'll just mention one that is very important. Uh, the archaeologist Kodui, a German archaeologist, back uh, before the uh, First World War, excavated Nebuchadnezzar's palace, the banquet hall where we, in, that we see prominent in Daniel chapter 5 with the handwriting on the wall, had been identified way back that early. It's since been rebuilt, by the way, by Saddam Hussein. We'll talk about that when we get there. And there are all kinds of details that critics used to point to in the book of Daniel that were wrong. It didn't, it didn't describe history as had been commonly accepted throughout the Western world. But subsequent discoveries not only validated Daniel's rendering of that history, they demonstrated that Daniel had to have been an eyewitness. And we'll cover some of that as we go. But the ultimate identification is Jesus Christ. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you have, you, you, you've just saved yourself hours of boring library research. Jesus quotes Daniel directly three times. He refers to Daniel the prophet. That's an interesting phrase because Daniel wasn't a prophet in the traditional sense. The book of Daniel is, is, was not collected with the prophetic writings in the old Hebrew Bible, but in the writings it was, it was treated as history rather than prophecy. Because Daniel was regarded by the, Jew, the rabbis as a governmental figure. He didn't have the office of the prophet in the traditional sense. He was a prophet in the sense that God blessed him with some revelations. He's quoted three times in the book of Ezekiel. In fact, he's classed with Noah, Job, and so forth. Um, it's, uh, in fact, Daniel is set up as a standard against which to measure wisdom by Ezekiel. And they were contemporaries, obviously. Daniel has uh, another interesting uh, characteristic. This one fascinates me. There are only two people in the Bible, other than Jesus Christ, of course, of which there's no evil spoken of. Who's the other guy beside Daniel? Anyone? Joseph, good for you. What's interesting is Daniel and Joseph have nothing negative said about them. Don't misunderstand, they weren't sinless. That's not the point. We're all sinners. But they were exemplary and uh, faithful and had nothing evil to say. And what fascinates me, they both were professional executives. So that's a, that's a high calling. That's interesting, I think. There are a number of foreign words. Some of the critics quibble that, well, there's, a bunch of, there's 15 Persian words and three Greek. No kidding. Here's a guy that rose to be prime minister of Babylon during those empires and not only survives that, rises to power in the succeeding empire in Persia. It wouldn't surprise me that he had skill in multiple languages. He was prime minister of two empires. So, in effect. So. Now, the organization of the book is in two halves. The first six chapters out of 12 are historical, narrative, and... Uh, uh, the first chapter we'll take tonight, he's deported as a teenager. We'll talk about that. The next chapter is where Nebuchadnezzar, this new king, has this bizarre dream and uh, challenges his, his advisors to explain what it means. And that's a, one of the most <laughs> colorful scenes in the Bible. And we'll take that, take that next time. We have the famous fiery furnace scene following. We have a very interesting chapter 4 that Nebuchadnezzar himself writes before it's over. And chapter 5 is the famous fall of Babylon, much misunderstood by many Bible teachers. We'll talk about that when we get there. And then we have the revolt of the Magi. 
Everybody wondered, we always talk about magi at Christmas, and I don't think one person in 100 knows what they were. The magi were Persians. They were, that's where we get the word magistrate. But the point is, the magi were a hereditary priesthood that Daniel is put in charge of. And that frosted them, so they contrived to get Daniel in the lion's den, strangely enough. Now, it turns out, from chapter 2 through chapter 7, the focus is on the Gentile world, and it happens to be in Aramaic, not Hebrew. From our point of view, they're very similar, but from the, that time, it, it was the Gentile language in contrast to the Hebrew language that Israel spoke. The first chapter of the next series of six is also in Aramaic because, again, it's, it deals with the Gentile world. So the first six are historical. The next six, chapter 7 through 12, are visions of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 7, we have four beasts that show up in a vision that turn out to be, again, a profile of Gentile history. And we'll talk about that when we get there. Chapter 8 will focus on the incredible career of Alexander the Great. Daniel chapter 9 is one of your most important chapters in the entire Bible, if you're a serious student of prophecy. When four disciples came to Jesus for a private briefing on a second coming, he, put, he focused them on that, th this passage, the last four verses of Daniel 9, as the key to all end-time prophecy. So we'll obviously be dealing with that intensely when we get there. Daniel 10 is one of these spooky chapters. In fact, it's a glimpse into the dark side, the spirit world that's at war, behind the scenes. Everything going on today that we see in the world are vestiges of a spiritual warfare going on unseen around us. And we see elections, we see empires rise and fall, but there are gigantic spiritual forces in contest behind the scenes. We'll get a glimpse of that in chapter 10 which is a prelude to the final climax of the book, chapters 11 and 12, which are the wrap-up. Chapter 11 deals with the so-called silent years, in part. We often, you'll find books in the library called the silent years, meaning the period of time, the 400 years between the close of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New. They call those the silent years. That's an uninformed title. Because those years are covered in the Bible in advance. Daniel chapter 11, 5 through 35, deals with the so-called silent years. And uh, obviously we'll deal with that. And then chapter 12 is the final wrap-up, the final consummation of all things, including, of course, the second coming and so on. Interesting, exciting book. Very fundamental. Probably the most, most important uh, 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 apocalyptic book, obviously, in the, in the uh, Old Testament. They're not in chronological order. That confuses some people. Here on the screen, I put them in chronological order. And they are relative to each other chronological. If you recognize that the first six are narrative, but chapters seven and eight are visions that occur between chapters four and five. And chapter nine occurs between chapters five and six chronologically. And obviously the closing visions are at the end. So they're in the right order, but we just have the first six of the history and the last Six are the visions, if you will, in detail. So that, I hope that is helpful. Okay, a little more about chron chronology. We've just finished studies of Jonah and Nahum, so you're familiar with the fact that after the Civil War, when, when Solomon died and Rehoboam and Jeroboam divided up the nation in two, we had the northern kingdom under Jeroboam and the southern kingdom under Rehoboam. The, the northern kingdom goes from bad to worse, and ultimately is conquered by the Assyrians in 722. So we've been through all that. The Assyrian Empire was dominant for several centuries. But we're now moving to the point where Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrian Empire, falls to Babylon and Media in 612 BC. It's the beginning of the breakup. About 609, three years later, Pharaoh Necho leads his army against what's left of Assyria. He's trying to cherry-pick some assets here. This is also an area that most commentators are um, not tuned into adequately because in 2 Chronicles 35, Josiah chooses to do something very strange at this time. When Pharaoh Necho goes against Assyria, now Assyria has been the traditional enemy of Israel for several hundred years. 
It's starting to fall apart. Pharaoh Necho is going against Assyria, and Josiah takes up arms against Pharaoh Necho. See, what on earth is going on? Most commentators have not figured it out. I actually, actually, one says that he th thinks he was trying to align with him. No, he gets killed in the, in the trial. Pharaoh Necho himself is bewildered. He says, what are you doing? I'm doing what God told me to do, which raises some other interesting questions. And I won't spend the time here to give you the whole story. It'll be a distraction. But there's a very good possibility that the Levites had taken the Ark of the Covenant out of the country to protect it from Manasseh's ravaging. And when Josiah takes over, he wants the Levites to bring it back. In verse 3 of 2 Chronicles 35, he asks them to return it to Israel. And uh, there's records that they, they had put it in, on Elephantine Island, which is the fortress capital of, of uh, Egypt, under the days of Pharaoh Necho. Pharaoh Necho had it there. Apparently had it, it was an operation of the Levites. The reason Josiah is going against Pharaoh Necho, he wants his ark back. But Pharaoh, Josiah gets killed, and we don't know what was going on, except we do have a, a documented record that the Ark of the Covenant went from Elephantine Island after two centuries to uh, Tana Kirkus Island on Lake Tana for eight centuries before going to Axum. And if that's all true, then it, they, it's very possible they really do have the Ark of the Covenant in Ethiopia today. And it's a, uh, the, 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 the beliefs they hold about how it got there are provably wrong. But what everybody's overlooked is that it may have gotten there by a path that they don't understand. And it's in the Bible. Uh, I mean, the, it, it's implied in the Bible. So, so anyway, Pharaoh Necho, anyway, it, by the way, Pharaoh Necho was not e Egyptian. He was Ethiopian, just as an aside. But within three years, we have the famous Battle of Karshemesh, and that's where Pharaoh Necho meets Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar wins, which makes the, the, the Battle of Karshemesh in 606 B.C., is the milestone that generally is marked as the beginning of what's called the Babylonian Empire. Babylon had been a city-state of the Assyrian Empire, a pawn of Assyrian politics, for centuries. But Nabopolassar, the king of the Babylon the city, had a son by the name of Nebuchadnezzar who was a sharp general. And he's maneuvered his way now to the point where at the defeat of Pharaoh Necho, which was the major remaining power in that region, that makes the Bab Babylon not just a city, but it's the beginning of the Babylonian Empire. Now that brings us to the first siege. On the way home, he lays siege to the city of Jerusalem, Nebuchadnezzar does. Jehoiakim is released as a, he succeeds. He releases their king Jehoiakim as a vassal king. He plunders the temple of some of its artifacts for his own museum. He takes hostages to assure the loyalty of Jehoiakim and also to train promising young men to serve at court in Babylon. And among those that are taken are four young Hebrew teenagers, somewhere between 12 and 15 years of age. And uh, Daniel, of course, is among them. But many people don't realize Daniel was of the royal line. He was one of the princes. These, were, these weren't just guys that showed promise. They were very, very promising youths, and they also had the right lineage. This first siege of Jerusalem begins a 70-year period that was prophesied to be the servitude of the nation. The nation Israel is to be a uh, uh, captive of Babylon for 70 years. Why 70 years? God tells us in 2 Chronicles 36. Because for 490 years, they failed to keep the sabbatical year of the land. Just as we have six days that you work and one that you rest, they were to plow the land for six years and let it rest a seventh year, a sabbatical year. They failed to keep that. And God says, you owe me 70. And that's in the end of chapter 36 of Second Chronicles. That's the, that's the very reason why it was predicted to be seven years. Don't confuse the servitude of the nation with the desolations of Jerusalem. Both of them are predicted to be 70 years, but they're not coterminous. That is, they start and end at different times, slightly. We'll come to that. Now, getting back to this, um, Jehoiakim is still king in Jerusalem, but he's subject to Babylon. His false prophets keep urging him to rebel against Nebuchadnezzar, we're God's chosen people, etc., etc., etc. There are two guys that say, don't do it. A guy by the name of Jeremiah and a guy by the name of Ezekiel. They're saying, don't do it. This is God's will. God is using Nebuchadnezzar as his arm of judgment. Yield to the will of God. 
They're treated as traitors. Jeremiah gets thrown in prison because he's preaching an unpopular message. So Jehoiakim finally does rebel. Nebuchadnezzar again lays another siege. And since he ignored Jeremiah's counsel, he rebels. There's a five-year battle. Jehoiakim dies, ultimately. His son, Jehoiachin, also called Jeconiah. He goes by two different names, by the way. In fact, three different names. He's called Jehoiachin. He's called Jeconiah. He's also called Coniah in some of your translations. Anyway, he reigns until the siege is finally over. And uh, you want to do some homework on Jehoiah Chin. There's a very interesting passage in Jeremiah 22, verse, the last verse in that chapter, where God says, see, Jehoiah Chin comes at a long list of bad news. And by the time you get to, to Jehoiah Chin, God says, no man of his seed shall prosper anymore in Judah. And they say, okay, so God's upset. He, he pronounced the blood curse on, that, on the royal line. Well, that creates a very fascinating theological problem. In fact, whenever I encounter this, I always visualize parties being thrown in Satan's council. Because Satan must have figured, boy, God has really done it to himself because he's committed himself that the Messiah will come from the royal line and now he's pronounced a blood curse on the only remaining threat of that royal line. And I always visualize, when I have those fantasies in my mind, I always visualize God turning to the angel and saying, watch this one. <laughs> and to solve that, you've got to look at the genealogies in Matthew and Luke. Matthew's Jewish, presents Jesus Christ as the, 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 the Mashiach Nagid, the Messiah, the King, and he starts, goes for the first Jew, Abraham, goes through Abram, through David, down through David, to the, through Solomon, the first surviving son of Bathsheba, down through Joseph, the legal father of Jesus Christ. Terrific. Luke is a Gentile. He is not oriented to that. He's oriented to Christ's humanity. He starts his genealogy, in effect, with Adam. Adam takes him down to Abraham. From Abraham to David, they're obviously both identical. But when you get to David, Luke does a very strange thing. He takes a left turn. He doesn't go through the first surviving son of Bathsheba, Solomon. He goes through the second surviving son of Bathsheba, a guy by the name of Nathan. Not Nathan the prophet, another guy. And takes it down through Heli, who is the father of Mary. But you need to understand the daughter of Zelophehad. If a, if a, a father had only daughters and she married in the tribe, he would adopt her husband as his son, and thus he would inherit. That's called the daughters of Zelophehad in the Torah. And it's astonishing to see how many commentaries miss the whole point of the daughters of Zelophehad because that, on that peculiar exception in the Torah that God instructs Moses to put in the Torah, it hangs the claims of Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is of the house and lineage of David, but it's by a virgin birth, therefore it's not carrying the blood curse of Jeconiah. So I challenge you to get into that because it, 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 nothing else, it'll give you a profound respect for the precision of the scripture and the elegance of God's designs. And uh, it also is a terrific piece of background to be able to talk about at Christmas. Why a virgin birth? There's an aspect of that most people haven't had a chance to get into. But anyway, Jeconiah is captured along with 10,000 captives, in fact, 1,000 artisans also, uh, in, this includes Ezekiel. So this is where Ezekiel also gets taken to Babylon. So from now on, Ezekiel's in Babylon, Jeremiah's in Jerusalem, both preaching, but uh, one by remote control. No internet in those days. Jeconiah's captured. Zedekiah, his uncle, is installed as the vassal king. And so that's uh, the second siege. Now Jeremiah from Jerusalem and Ezekiel from Babylon warn Zedekiah, don't make the mistake of your, for, your previous guy. Don't rebel. Nebuchadnezzar is God's instrument of judgment. But obviously the king is surrounded by false prophets. Say, hey, get some on an ego trip. We're God's people. Let's rebel. So that he does, and that leads to siege number three. Because Zedekiah ignores Jeremiah's and Ezekiel's warnings, and he yields to the false prophet, and he rebels. Now, by this time, Nebuchadnezzar had a belly full of the whole operation. So this time when he lays siege, he wipes out the city. Understand that up till now, 
Jeremiah and Ezekiel have been telling him, look, don't rebel or you'll destroy the city. The city has been besieged twice, but it was left, he just took control. He didn't destroy the city. If you rebel, he's going to destroy the city. They do rebel, and that's exactly what Nebuchadnezzar did. He destroys the temple. He plunders the place, and that's uh, the end of it. That starts a period of time called the Desolations of Jerusalem. Many scholars confuse those two as being the same. Servitude of the nation, this be the Babylon captivity, 70 years. Yes, it was. The desolations of the city of Jerusalem are 70 years, but it's a different 70 years. And uh, I'll show you that. So we, this begins that 70 year desolations of Jerusalem from the third siege. It's interesting to read some of the prophecies. Ezekiel said, uh, God said through Ezekiel, My net also will I spread upon him, and he shall be taken in my snare, and I will bring him to Babylon, to the land of the Chaldeans. Yet he shall, shall he not see it, though he shall die there. And Jeremiah also said, Then the king of Babylon slew the... It records, because he was there. Then the king of Babylon slew the sons of Zedekiah in Riblah before his eyes. Also the king of Babylon slew all the nobles of Judah. Moreover, he put out Zedekiah's eyes and bound him with chains to carry him to Babylon. Do you understand what Ezekiel said? He says, you're not going to see Babylon, though you'll die there. He didn't see Babylon. He was blinded first. But he was taken to Babylon captive and ultimately does die there. I mentioned that do you, as you encounter these things, pay attention to the precision. God means what he says and says what he means. Now, the Babylonian period, we talked about the first siege of Nebuchadnezzar. That starts the servitude of the nation, 70 years. The second siege, they rebel the second siege. He installs Zedekiah. Zedekiah also rebels. So at least to the third siege, that starts a period called the desolations of Jerusalem. Both of those periods are 70 years long, but they're different 70 years. Sir so Robert Anderson is one of the few that recognized that precision and made some discoveries as a result of that. The, ser the, the servitude of the nation starts with the first siege. It ends when Cyrus the Persian conquers Babylon. As he walks into that city, he's confronted with a letter written to him in a 150-year-old book called Isaiah, calling him by name and outlining his career. He's so blown away, it's a matter of record. He releases him and gives him money to go, go home and build their temple. That ends the Babylonian exile, or the servitude of the nation. And it also starts the Persian Empire, obviously. In that Persian Empire, there's a guy by the name of Artaxerxes who has a cupbearer by the name of Nehemiah. Under Ezra, they've gone back there and they've tried to rebuild their temple, but they're not getting very, not, almost 20 years go by and they haven't gotten very far because they're harassed too much. Nehemiah, being Jewish, but being a cupbearer to the Persian king, gets permission to rebuild the city, the walls, which is what they were missing. And he goes back there and they rebuild the walls. That's the de decree of Artaxerxes. And that triggers a prophecy that we're going to study when we get to chapter 9. That is the most astonishing document on the planet Earth. And we'll look at that when we get there. But this is the background. Second Chronicles takes you up to the decree of Cyrus. Uh, then Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra takes you to the period up till the Artaxerxes, Nehemiah following. To give you a feeling of the historical books uh, in the book. In terms of prophecy books, Daniel, of course, and Ezekiel are essentially contempor contemporaneous at the early part of this. And uh, Haggai and, uh, uh, and uh, Zechariah and the Ezra and Nehemiah period, Malachi at the end, of course. Okay, let's just jump into the book itself, make some progress here. Chapter 1, and I'll call this Dare to be a Daniel. These teenagers are going to be an example to every one of us. Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim uh, of Judah came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And let me just dismiss, there's a lot of confusion about exactly third year, that when you try to compare this with some other passages, they don't seem to quite agree. Let me just cut through it. Some of them are reckoning at time as the Babylonians would record it, and some as the Jews would record it. They use slightly different conventions as when did a reign begin. And if you get through that, there's no disagreement. So we won't waste a lot of time with that. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. How did Nebuchadnezzar win? God ordained it, whether he knew it or not. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand 
with part of the vessels of the house of God. Not all of them, but part of them. He's going to get the rest later. Um, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. The word Shinar, it, occur, it occurs seven times in the Old Testament. It always refers to the region of Babylon. If Babylon is a city, Shinar is the county. The plain of Shinar is where Babylon uh, sits. So it's, a, it's for our purposes, like it's the land of Shinar is a synonym for Babylon. And uh, okay, and now Jeho we can talk more about Jehoiakim. His name is really Eliakim. You may some of those names will throw you if you but let that go. The kings of the Babylon. Neb Nebuchadnezzar was the king of, the, of Babylon. He had a son that was a great general by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. And it's during that siege, that first siege or thereabouts, that Nebuchadnezzar finds out his dad has died. And so he rushes home to take over the throne. He inherits a bunch of advisors, from old cronies from his father's reign. He doesn't know whether they can cut the mustard or not. So he gives them a test in chapter 2 that's got to be one of the most dramatic uh, things in the scripture. We'll, get, we'll take that when we get there. Nebuchadnezzar has four children, two, two sons and two daughters. Evil Merodach is his son. When, he later, when, when Nebuchadnezzar finally does die in, 19, in, in, in 562, after, you know, after reigning some 40 some odd years, um, Evil Merodach reigns for a while, two years. Um, another of his daughters married. We've lost track of her. But uh, after Evil Merodach, uh, Nereglesser uh, reigns for about four years. But finally, Nebuchadnezzar's other daughter marries a guy by Nabonidus, and Nabonidus is not a winner. In fact, he's not even interested in being king. So he has his son, well, by the way, Labashi Marduk, the son of Nereglesser, reigned for two months too. It was a rough palace time. <laughs> um, so Nabonidus has a son by the name of Belshazzar, and he is reigning when Babylon falls to the Persians. And it's very interesting because for many, many years, Scholars said this whole thing in Daniel about Belshazzar is nonsense because Nabonidus was the king when the Persians took over. But we've made discoveries that point out that Nabonidus was away most of the time. He wasn't interested in being king. He was, had some other intrigues down in Arabia. He wasn't even around most of the time. He let his son really run the place. And Belshazzar was in charge when the Persians did take it over. And that, had, that record we have in Daniel had to be by an eyewitness. And we'll get into that in chapter 5. Let's move on with verse 4, 3 and 4, 3 and 4. And the king spake to Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish but well favored, skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge, understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. Now, I think you get the general picture here. They're, the, a very enlightened technique. Nebuchadnezzar would take the best of his captives and try to train them in postgraduate school for service. They're going to be in three years of special training in the hopes that they would be, first of all, well chosen and well taught so they're qualified to stand before the king and, and be useful. Uh, and if they're skilled in multiple languages and the, and the cultural background from which they came, that's useful. But they've got to be converted. They've got to be imbued. Got, he's got to turn them into Babylonians. But I want to catch a couple of things as you go here. This is the book of Daniel, right? This is the fall of the house of Judah, the southern kingdom, right? Two centuries ago, the northern kingdom fell to Assyria, right? We have the ten lost tribes, right, called the house of Israel. You have heard those stories? There weren't ten lost tribes, by the way, but that's, that's neither here nor there. I want you to notice something in verse 3 that everybody misses. King spake to Ashpenaz, the master of eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of whom? Israel. I want you to notice that that term is used of these people that are of the house of Judah. That term is used connotatively for the nation. We're not, there are people that try to make a case that when it says Israel, it means the northern kingdom and Judah south. When they're both around, the northern kingdom called itself the house of Israel and the southern kingdom called itself the house of Judah. Don't presume for a moment that either one is restricted to any particular tribes. The faithful in the northern kingdom went south to stay faithful to the temple. 
the idolaters in the South went north to be where idolatry was the politically correct thing to do. The Levites went south. By the way, if you take Simeon and Judah and Benjamin, who were in the south already, and the Levites who joined them, you've got four out of 12. If there's lost tribes, there's only eight, not 10. But don't confuse the geography with the tribal lineage. That's where everybody goes down these paths and they get all these fables having to do with the so-called 10 lost tribes. The tribe of Dan is a special case. We'll deal with that on another evening. Okay, uh, but I want you to notice all through the scripture, you'll find Israel and Judah used connotatively. Jews are Judah and not Israel. No, they're not. There's, you know, they're, anyway. Sons of, okay. Sons of Abram, Isaac, and Yaakov. You can, you're calling them Jews. You're not talking about the tribe of Judah. That's linguistically linked, but not otherwise. Anyway. Now, these, these young guys had no blemish. They're favorite, skillful, and wisdom, and so forth. These were top-grade guys, teenagers, probably 12 to 14 years old. Can you imagine them? Now, they're snatched from lovely homes. They were royal. These were pampered guys, well-taught. Snatched from that and sent to a foreign country. And uh, handsome, socially uh, experienced, well-liked by everybody. We'll see that continue in their, in their new life. And they're perfect examples. And uh, don't knock. Now, the Babylonians, of course, full of all kinds of strange ideas, theologically. But don't knock them scientifically. The reason we have 360 degrees in a circle, the reason we have 60 minutes to an hour and 60 seconds to a minute, comes from a hexadecimal system which comes from the Babylonians. The Babylonians' astronomy, while clearly imperfect in many ways, was profound for its day. And out of that came all kinds of religious things from which certain astrological traditions have, have continued. Not the foolishness of astrology today, all astrology is foolish, but the ones today, is, even if you really get into the history, is bizarre. The idea that it's somehow things are determined by the moment you're born is, is, a, is a relatively modern twist. Anyway, moving on. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat. Now, this isn't barracks rations here. This is the king's cuisine. These guys are being well treated for captives. The king appointed them a daily provision of king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. He didn't want them to waste away in a, in a barracks. He wanted presentable princes here. Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Those are their Hebrew names. Unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. For he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, of Hananiah, of Shadrach, of Mishael, Meshach, and of Azariah, Abednego. Now, I won't ask you to repeat the Hebrew names, but I know you can repeat the Babylonian names, thanks to the song. You know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, we all know the names from the song. We got the wrong names, by the way. Typical, but anyway. Um, Daniel was called Belteshazzar, Hananiah, Shadrach, Mishael, Meshach, Hazariah, Abednego. Scholars uh, are not uh, exactly precisely in agreement to what these names mean. But typically, Daniel means God is my judge. Hananiah means beloved of the Lord or something like that. Mishael, who is as God. And Azariah, the Lord is my help, or close to that. Notice that in the, 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 the name of God appears in each of them, either with the El or the Yah, one way or the other. The Babylonians are trying to get them to conform to their world. Belteshazzar means prince of Bel. See, Daniel's like the judge of God or the prince of God. He wants the prince of Bel. Shadrach means illumined by the sun god. Meshech, who is like the moon god. Don't knock that moon god. He's worshipped by, uh, that's the Islamic god, right? And Abednego, servant of Nego, the shining fire. Oh, by the way, before I forget to mention, don't confuse Belteshazzar, the name of Daniel, the Babylonian name of Daniel, it won't be much of a problem because most of the time we'll call him Daniel, the text does. But don't confuse him with Nebuchadnezzar's grandson called Belshazzar. They're very similar, but they're two different guys. And uh, something interesting about Abednego, the word nego in Chaldean transfers as nogia, which means Lucifer. So that's kind of interesting. But the whole idea is to change their identity and their destiny. Change their identity uh, from being God's children to be Babylonian children and to be their destiny to Babylon rather than Jerusalem. 
And uh, both of these then would be reinforced by constant use of these names, presumably. But here's the good news, verse 8. Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, understand, there's nothing wrong with eating meat. That's not the point. The point is that some of the, the, the king's cuisine were things prohibited in the Mosaic law. This is, not, this is not an argument to be a vegetarian, as you'll see. It's an argument to not have to eat meat that's offered as idols. The practice in those days that meat that was served was for, part of the process was it was offered to idols first. That would be offensive to a Jew. They didn't bother doing that with the vegetables. So that's why they're, they're looking, they're, they're, Daniel is resolved to try to get around this problem. So now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of eunuchs. Notice that Daniel had already earned the respect and the, and the, the uh, affection, if you will, of, of uh, his boss, his bosses. The prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king who hath appointed your meat and your drink, for why should he see your faces worse uh, uh, liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall ye make me endanger my head to the king. And by the way, he had reason to be nervous. Nebuchadnezzar didn't mess around. And uh, so his, the officer's fears are very justified. See, Nebuchadnezzar, we'll find out, was known to put out the eyes of people after killing their children in front of them. He was known for making their houses into dunghills. He's going to threaten that in the next chapter. He's used, he, he, there are occasions when he roasted his officers over a fire. This is Saddam Nebuchadnezzar we're talking about here, okay? How would you have handled the situation? The word is out. You've got to have this diet. It's a great diet. It's top, top quality stuff, but you're trying to stay faithful to your own ritual practices. And uh, you're, you're endangering your boss's life by not conforming, right? What do you do? How do you handle this? Lots of possible ways. One is to give in. That's one possibility. Daniel chose not to do that. You get somebody preaching, you get them all to change to your diet. Didn't try to do that. What do you do? How would you handle the situation? Well, then Daniel said to Melzar, whom the prince of eunuchs had set over Daniel, in other words, the intermediate guy here, um, had set over Daniel, Hananiah, and Mishael, and Azariah, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days. Let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Now, by the way, pulse is a word that's generally presumed to be vegetables, but it actually is a word that comes from seeds. So it may have been planted vegetables, or it could be some kind of grain meal, or some oatmeal or something, something of that nature. That's the idea. But the main point is, see, it's not offered to idols. They didn't bother doing it with that, and yet it's wholesome. Give us pulse to eat and water to drink. And let our countenance be looked upon before thee and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So Daniel proposes a test. Ten days, that's no, thing, that, that's no time at all. Give us a try. And see if we embarrass you by looking peaked or whatever. See? Pretty cool. And ten days is, uh, 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 ten is always a measurement of test or, or, or uh, testimony. And, uh, but I notice the whole thing, this isn't prisoner's ration we're trying to duck here. This is the king's meat. This is top stuff. And we go through all the other things. But So he consented them in this manner and proved them ten days. And at the end of ten days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. So they made the test so their boss was not in jeopardy, and yet they were able to maintain their ritual uh, uh, position. And as for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill and learning and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. The way it's actually translated better is the lads, the four of them. So all four of them prospered here. All four of them got learning. The word learning here is actually taking root meaning book. Uh, it's designating the world of letters, interestingly enough, and literature. The word wisdom really does, designates the proverbial lore of, of, the, of the ancient uh, culture and uh, the uh, intelligent, intelligently arranged body of principles is one way it's, it's rendered, if you will. It's what we would call science. And some of their folklore 
is no worse than the folklore that masquerades as science today. You know, it's astonishing to me that our culture, that regards itself as being technologically so sophisticated, insists upon embracing a fundamental presumption that's disprovable, that everything happened by, in the absence of design. You look through a microscope and a telescope and insist upon saying, I don't see design there. That's all randomness. That all happened by random chance. I won't, we, we, we'll leave that one on. Um, but the term says all learning, not just the Babylon God gave them, knowledge and skill, and all learning. And that was far more than just the superstitious slower of the pagan priests. Although knowing that was probably important in order to interpret what was going on. And... Uh, Researchers have uh, uh, indicated that uh, in addition to astronomy, an adjunct of pagan worship, of course, is architecture, linguistics, agriculture, meteorology, agronomy, and uh, many of the other sciences were well developed in the land between the two rivers. That's what Mesopotamia means. There's a very, very high skill level in this region in, that, in those days. Okay, now at the end of the days that the king said he should bring them in, then the prince of eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Big test coming up here. The king communed with them, and among them all was found none, like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. In other words, they got, they got their merit badges. They, they won. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. We'll talk about some of these job descriptions in the next chapter. There are about five of them. And we'll tell you what they are, but frankly, they so overlap. These are their staff advisors, heavily involved in the occult, but basically the ones that primarily advise the king. And uh, sacred scribes, astrologers, you name it. Practicers of the occult arts of all kinds. But the, these four Jewish young men outclassed them all. And Daniel continued even to the first year of the King Cyrus. This is a predictive passage. This doesn't come up until chapter, what, 10, I guess. But the point is, it's just an anticipatory summary. Daniel's going to outlast them all, including, obviously, Nebuchadnezzar, etc. Well, we've gone through this rather hurriedly, but let's talk a little bit about the moral heroism that we see here. These teenagers, I don't want to dismiss this, they got deported, they stood up and recounted. They had discernment. That's one of the first things. They, they saw precisely what was wrong with eating the prescribed food they were discerning to begin with. And where would they have learned this? Huh? Where? Where? Specifically? Yes, in Jerusalem. Where? In their homes. You got it. There's only one form of biblical schooling in the Bible, and that's homeschooling. Yeah. And, and hey, 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 yeah. <laughs> Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 9, is your verse on that. These guys were obviously well trained at home. They were trained with resistance to evil. And uh, just because they were distant from their home didn't weaken their resolve to keep themselves distant from evil. It's a non-trivial issue. These guys weren't at home or in a suburb of Jerusalem. They were at the capital of the world. And uh, so this obviously, again, is, I think, a testimony to the home that they came from. Because children don't naturally resist evil. They embrace it. This took training. And they were obviously well-trained. They also had the power to voice disagreement. You know, this impresses me because they were young. You know, when you're older, you get a little more moral fiber. But when you're kids, you know, it's, there's a peer pressure thing. There's a, hey, let's just roll and get along because you're, you're, you're off balance a little bit, you know. That's, by the way, where the homeschoolers do better because the homeschoolers have more social communion with adults than their contemporaries that are not homeschooled because they have lots of peer pressure with their own age. But the only adults they run are their teachers. You know, it, 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 it's, the studies are very interesting that are coming up that the that the homeschoolers are better socially adjusted than the public school kids. It's amazing. Um, but anyway, these obviously were, had fiber. Um, physical courage. We're going to discover they have a lot of physical courage. <laughs> um, but they, they um, you know, the, 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 the prince of the eunuchs was right. You know, his head was uh, in danger. Nebuchadnezzar knew how to reduce head count. 
And the most important head count is your own, you know. So, uh, but in, in, uh, in uh, the lion's den and other places, uh, uh, we find, they had perseverance, they stuck with it. And uh, so, when he didn't get help from the big boss, he went to this, the boss's steward and, uh, and was able to get it. And of course, they were determined. He purposed in his heart, the scripture says. That's where it all starts. That's your most important stewardship. Take a piece of paper sometime and list the things that you have to be, that you're stewards of. You know, your business, your bank account, your family, your properties, whatever. What's your most important stewardship? Your heart. Your heart. And that's where Daniel started. He didn't have a shallow purpose. He was serious. Yet he did it meekly. No mock heroics here. He respectfully requested. He sought out what he was after. He was, he was effective in that regard. And he obviously had good sense. The trial, he suggested, was discerning, perceptive, effective, creative. Good answer. Creativity. Good, good response. So Daniel's career, he's destined to rise to prime, uh, like prime minister of Babylon. We'll see how that starts to happen next chapter. When they get conquered by their enemies, he rises to power in the Persian Empire. And uh, he's also going to personally receive the most astonishing passages in the Bible. The angel Gabriel is going to interrupt his prayer in chapter 9 and just blow you away with what he lays out specifically in front of him. And Daniel's career is authenticated. How do I know this is all true? Because Jesus said so. Jesus Christ himself said so. And as I say, he was classed with Noah and Job in terms of his stature in the holy of all books. Now, who's in charge all through here? One of the things, lessons we get here is, you see, God gave them to the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the scripture says. God caused the official to show favor. God gave them skill. See, behind this, if you look, if, you, if we went through the chapter a second time, you notice at every critical juncture, the guy pulling the strings is the ruler of the universe himself. That's exciting. That's exciting to realize God has his hand on you. If you give him a chance. Now, if God can do that to individuals, he can also do that to nations. God works behind nations, and that's what we're going to see next time. The times of the Gentiles revealed is what we're going to. There's a period of time called the times of the Gentiles. The Ark of the Covenant is no longer in Israel's hands. It's put away until the Messiah comes. From Nebuchadnezzar until the Antichrist is a period of time that the New Testament in, chapter Luke, in, in the book of Luke calls the times of the Gentiles. That's what we're going to deal with in chapter 2. It's going to all lay out for you there. A timeline of all subsequent history is a subject next time, including what's just ahead for you and I. What's going to happen in Iraq and Iran and the rest of it? We'll deal with that next time. I have to share with you something. We touched something a little earlier. This is not going to be for your homework because this is, we're going to move out the fringe a little bit here. But we talked about the first siege, servitude of the nation, second siege, third siege being the desolation of Jerusalem, and uh, how degree of Cyrus, the fall of Babylon ends the servitude of the nation and it starts the Persian Empire, how the degree of Xerxes triggers a prophecy we're going to deal with in chapter 9. There is an interesting, and we talked about, this is a slide from before. There is an interesting prophecy in the book of Ezekiel that causes a lot of people trouble. Because God predicts, prophesies, 430 years of judgment on the nation. 430 years of judgment. Ezekiel chapter 4. 70 of those years, we know, are here in Babylon that serve to the nation. 300, that leaves 360 that don't fit anything. You try to fit that 360, it, it, it's a problem. But someone some time ago noticed that uh, in Leviticus chapter 26, it says, If ye will not yet for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. In other words, if you don't obey me the first time, I'm going to multiply your punishment by seven. And I said, well, gee, that's interesting. If we multiply the 360 by seven, it comes out to 2,520. And that's roughly the time from then throughout the end of the diaspora. And that's as far as anyone ever took it. And I thought, well, wait a minute. We, one thing we learned from Sir Robert Anderson, and we'll get to that in Chapter 9, 
is that God deals in 360-day years. So if we, t if we assume that these 360 times 7, these 2520 years are 360-day years, how do we put that on our calendar to see what's going on here? Well, it turns out that 2520 years of 360 days turn out to be 2483 years of 365 days, and you have nine months and 21 days left over. And we go through the math here. Julian year is 11 minutes and 10.46 seconds longer than the mean solar year. The Gregarian reform recognized this, and 11 days were removed from our calendar during that reform. And then you also have to figure out leap years, um, because in six, uh, 2,483 years, you've got, uh, you divide that by four, that would give you 621 leap years, but that gives you three too many every four centuries. That gives you 18 excess. So if you go through that whole rigmarole, you've got 614 days of leap years to deal with. Anyway, when you go through all the arithmetic, it turns out that 2,520 years of 360 days is 907,200 days raw. But if you divide that on our calendar, it turns out to be 2,483 years, nine months, 20 days, and 21 days. And you say, gee, check, that's very thrilling. What do you want me to do with that? <laughs> the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> but let's try and see what happens. If we take this slide that we had a few moments ago, if you take the 2,520 years from the uh, servitude of the nation, you come to the restoration of the nation on May 14th of 1948. Well, that's kind of wild. But what happens if you take the 2,520 years from the decree of Artaxerxes, the, the end of the desolations of Jerusalem? You come to June 7th of 1967, when as a result of the Six-Day War, Jerusalem was returned to the nation of Israel. What a coincidence. <laughs> now, I'm cheating here a little bit because it's not precise to the day, but it's close because we don't know the exact days that some of these events occurred. But if you go through a servitude nation, the 70 years, by the way, are 69 years less two days because they're, again, we're dealing with 360-day years, and that works out. And if you go through all this arithmetic, you come, uh, you, if July 23rd, 537 B.C. was the release, uh, then uh, May 14th of 48 is the, would be the anniversary of that. Well, that's kind of interesting. That's the day, of course, that the nation of Israel was restored as a st in statehood. In fact, where David Ben-Gurion on international radio using Ezekiel as his authority names the new Jewish homeland Israel. That's kind of fun. What a coincidence. See, the rabbis will tell you coincidence is not a kosher word. Desolations of Jerusalem. Again, we take the 69 years, the last two days that are the 70 years equivalent, and we go through that whole rig rigmarole. You come to June 7th of uh, 1967, which, of course, is the, when the biblical city of Jerusalem was restored to the nation. Kind of fun stuff. So I thought I would share that with you. Um, we're out in left fringe here. This, the, you know, this is, I, 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 it's not uh, to the exact day because we're not sure of the exact day, but it's, it's because we don't know the, the trigger points precisely. But we know the seasons and they're close. So that's kind of fun. So that's the first chapter of the book of Daniel. I'd like you next time to read Daniel chapter 2. And if you have an extra time, read chapter 7. We won't deal with it head on there, but it would be good background for you. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. And let's buy our hearts. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for the excitement of discovery that we find every time we turn a page. We thank you, Father, for loving us so much as to give us not only your word, but your word incarnate, the person of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for the Holy Spirit. We do ask, Father, that he would attend each of us individually and guide us as we search for more discoveries in this precious, precious book, collection of books that you've given us. We thank you, Father. And Father, we would pray that through that Holy Spirit and through that word, you would illuminate the path before us as we too have opportunities for moral heroism day to day. Help us, Father, too, to have the discernment and the resolve and the perseverance and the creativity to resolve these issues in a way that will please you. We thank you, Father, for your word. We also pray, Father, that you would illuminate precisely what it is you'd have of us in the days ahead, that we each might be better stewards, first of all, of our own hearts, that would reprioritize our lives with you at the head. Help us, Father, 
to overcome the tendency of the urgent preempting that which is important. We do pray, Father, that you would help us be better stewards, more fruitful stewards, and more pleasing in your sight as we commit ourselves into your hands without any reservations. In the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.